Thanks everybody for coming out to this panel. Uh, my name is Chris Anderson. I'm a co-founder at Couchbase. And um, I'm excited about this specifically because the industry we're talking about is moving so fast. Um, but before we get into it, I, I want to let these guys introduce themselves because I know they'll do a better job than I would. So uh, Lou, do you want to go ahead and start? Sure. Um, I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at Shufflemaster. And one of my duties there is to um, uh, oversee the creation of our online uh, gaming initiative. Uh, that's uh, Social Casino as well as Four Money Casino games, uh, specifically table games, which we're well known for around the world, uh, and our slot content, which we have from Australia. So it's a, a pretty big undertaking. Um, so it's a, a little tiny startup company being built inside of a rather large and heavily regulated organization. <laughs> Uh, my background is from Zenga. I was uh, the vice president of studios about a year ago for almost a year. And before that at IAC, which um, ran their, uh, their streaming, their download streaming content uh, division. And prior to that, some of you guys might know me from uh, Westwood Studios. I'm the founder of Westwood. We created Command and & Conquer and a bunch of other fun games over the years. So done a lot of things in games and now I'm in the other kind of games, gambling. Great. So my name is Zhang Shen. I'm the lead server engineer at Tencent. Tencent is a very diverse company that, I mean, basically focused on internet business. Uh, but a majority of the Tencent business is game industry. So uh, we do a lot of game development and game operations. So I'm working for a studio called Storm Games, which is a 100% uh, owned studio by Tencent. It's located in Concord, Massachusetts. So previously we were doing a lot of MMO game development. And then last year we, we, we feel the change of the trend and when we start make the move. Um, now we are focusing on social games. So the game we are currently working on called um, Global Rising and it's basically targeted on the Facebook platform. And it's basically a 3D game and on the web environment. So we, we try to provide some u the Facebook users more option to play some I mean, more engaged game and be with great, better graphic. So this is basically the goal we are trying to achieve. The game is currently in open beta, and, and you can try with that later. Yep, thanks. My name is Ken Williams. Um, I'm the chief technology officer for Sojo Studios, a social gaming company. Um, I'm responsible for all of the technology on the back end, um, from the databases to the data warehouse, um, any of the architecture on the system side. Um, my background is in uh, systems engineering, <coughs> systems automation, um, and large-scale data warehouses. Cool. Thanks, guys. Um, so I guess to get started, the first, the first sort of question um, uh, that I'm interested, I mean, I suppose in the audience, my guess is that we're a little bit more uh, database geeks than social game geeks. Um, so, so my question is, is almost more of an in industry question. Um, I've heard the term um, escape velocity thrown around. I think you mentioned something about that this morning, where uh, you see these games you know, start to take off, and almost they can be too successful for their own good. Um, so I, I suppose um, you know, I'm curious uh, from all three of you, actually, how you can tell, well, uh, how you can tell which, you know, which games are going to be a hit early on. Um, and, and maybe before, you, before anyone answers, we should cheers. <laughs> oh, sure, sure. <laughs> I'm going to take one cube here. Get the loosh. <laughs> cheers. Cheers. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so escape velocity, who wants to start on that? Why not your start? Because sure. your background is Zynga. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, in, in, a, in a sort of tragic way at Zynga, you would watch games coming online, and we'd be monitoring their progress. and. You'd see them start to go and say, oh, yep, that one's going to hit a wall. And you'd feel it. You could see it in the data. Um, and the answer, though, that I think the more important answer to the question is actually the people launching those games rarely know that that's what went wrong. They very, very rarely know that it was their hardware, their infrastructure, because the, um, the pattern of adoption or lack of adoption of a game um, due to just a lack of virality or a lack of interest is very similar to the pattern of fall off of customers when you start bumping into these, uh, these problems. It's, it's a, people imagine it like a cliff, but it's really not. It's a continuing resistance to a, to a game experience. There certainly are some cliffs if you really go fast, but that's not typically what happens. So um, the way I, I, I like to always conceptualize it is if you think about it as um, almost like, a, like a, neuro, a, a social network, like a brain with neurons, when you light them up, 
if they start talking to each other, the, the, the effect of the, of the pathway is, is brighter, and so it lights up other pathways. And people will tell you this in, in marketing, uh, that if you can get multiple impressions in rapid succession, they have a much better value than just adding up the number of impressions. And that's why sometimes you'll hear radio ads run twice in a row or, or television. They, they work sometimes, and then they, they fail on others. But generally speaking, it does well. So what happens with these games, we talk about escape velocity. You can see them going. <coughs> you can see the... Um, the retention rate, the the, uh, the the day over day or DAU, and you can see that they're holding on to their customers, and they're really getting a lot of virality out there. And then all of a sudden, the virality that was working so great at 50,000, 60,000, 100,000 suddenly starts falling off. And now it could be that you've got a whole bunch of new customers. Probably not. Probably what's happened is you're running into infrastructure problems, and if um, if you're not seeing them because you're not metricing them right, and you're not measuring them, then you just go blithely about your business, going, "Oh, that one didn't work." and move on. And uh, uh, you could really see it illustrated, I think, probably most obviously, if you guys jump on app data, go back and look at um, uh, SimSocial. You can actually watch SimSocial hit each of its points because it had such great velocity that it actually broke the systems completely. And so you could actually watch the, the DAU do these kind of like crazy movements. And so you could actually see the impact of uh, infrastructure changes. Most of the time, you don't get the luxury of seeing that. So most of the time, your games just don't work, and you think it's the game. So, so my experience about that, I don't have much experience in the social game industry, but I have some background in the MMO world. So basic, I, I know how to compare them. Basically, com by comparing the social game with the traditional game, the difference is social game adds uh, one more channel, which is a viral channel, right? It's, it could be easily aggregated, and you, it, sometimes it could be out of control in that case. Um, so that, that basically creates some unpredicted, I mean, facts that when you release the game, suddenly your user base could grow in a rapid speed that you won't be able to control that. So this is the one thing. The other thing, on the other side, it's kind of easier to control the, uh, the, the, the promotion method because you're basically doing that by uh, advertising and you basically like, just release some ads online for example on Facebook and people just click your ads they can stop playing your game immediately these kind of some direct control of the promotion this is different from the traditional game because traditional game when people see something they have to purchase the game they have to download a big client you, don't, you never know if pe people are going to I mean, keep playing that after, after they, they download it or they, 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 or they purchase that, because people can change their mind very quickly. But it's li a, li a little bit different in social game. So another thing is the life, cir life circle of social game is relatively shorter than a traditional MMO game. I mean, I mean when people have I mean, thousands of selections every day, when, when they, I mean, when they have different friends playing different games, they can, they can easily change their mind. So when they are playing, for example, they're playing Fine Veil today, and some, sometimes their the friend told them that, um, I mean, go to play another game much better than Farm Veil, and you, you, we are all playing that. I mean, that user could be easily change their mind to move from Farm Veil to another game. So this user will be a lost user for Farm Veil. So, so this basically creates those kind of, uh, um, I mean, kind of the user uh, uh, I mean, DAU in a very I mean, unpredictable I mean, changing I mean, curve. Like you can easily get that curve growing and suddenly it drops. So, so in this case, a scalable system is pretty important in my opinion. So you can easily adapt to the change. Definitely one of the things to really wrangle early on are the uh, data and, and metrics with these social games, we've seen many of them ramp up from, you know, zero users to hundreds of thousands of users, you know, basically overnight. Um, and, you know, coupling those metrics, the, the vir virality of the game with some really good systems monitoring and performance to understand, you know, when, when the curve when, when the curve starts to hit that peak, is it actually a, a systems problem or an architecture problem, or is the, uh, the virality starting to peak off? So yeah, so it sounds like kind of the, the take home message is um, <coughs> your game is gonna grow real fast and this might be a surprise, 
and failure to be ready for that surprise could could mean failure of the game uh, in, in terms of you know not reaching its full potential okay. without any real visibility as to what the cause was. Um, yeah, so that that was you said earlier. You know, if you've got the right metrics on it, then maybe you can distinguish between you know audience disinterest and audience wanting to click the share button, but the share button's too slow. Right, or the or the uh, the load times. You know, when we were at Instant Action, we saw a lot of. Um, just a massive drop off at the time it was about eight seconds i would probably say it's shorter now and there's a certain number of seconds that what users are just not willing to wait mm -hmm. and so you'll never see that metric because they'll have clicked on the link they'll go to do the load and they'll abandon so it looks like they're hitting the back button or abandoning you don't know why um, yeah. and if you're not right on top of your systems and you really understand that it's taking you longer to get those initial screens up you won't see the metrics you won't see your funnel there's been some uh <coughs> kind of parallel studies from the e-commerce world with amazon and google showing that you know, you get in, especially with Amazon, you get into the trance, like I'm gonna buy this book and this music and whatever, and you know, even if it's not always super fast, right, it's gotta have a rhythm to it, and as soon as they break the rhythm, that's when they see shopping cart abandonment. Yep. yep. Um, so, so then, like, uh, what particular metrics are you looking for? Is it really a latency-based thing, or do you have to do kind of second order, you know, looking at gameplay and stuff? You definitely look deeper. Um, you know, the people ask all the time, well, what's if coming from the games industry, not for this room because you guys are all talking about no skill databases, so you're, you're sharp. <laughs> but coming from the games industry, one of the things that people do all the time is say, well, what, what data do I need to store? What do I need to keep? And my answer is a little pithy, but maybe a little snarky. And I said, well, that data that you didn't store, <coughs> that's the most important data. Um, <coughs> and uh, the reason I say that is because of when when you're thinking like an R&D guy and you're building something, you're not thinking about how it's going to operate in a live environment. When you're running a live environment and your, your PM is sitting there doing the research to try to figure out what was the cause of, what's the causality of some change in your metrics, if they can't dig into the data and find answers to questions, then uh, essentially they're blind. And uh, smart people in a room without data is pretty much a good, more good formula for failure. You really need the data. Yeah, I definitely have to agree with that. You know, it, when I was working on big data systems at Yahoo, we kind of had this philosophy of just store everything <coughs> because you never know when that piece of data is going to be important. And, you know, today, disk space is cheap. And, and elasticity, too, is the other. That's yeah, me. exactly. <laughs> I mean, I want to say the same thing. We store tr almost all the user transactions into the d database. So this is all, this is not just for matrix. It's also good for, like, bug tracker in the future. Or it's, if, if, for example, if some user is cheating, right? It, by seeing all the transactions, we can easily find what the user did, if he's doing that in a, a legal way or not. I mean, basically, uh, this is what we are trying to do. I mean, storing everything. And so in gambling, it's actually legally required. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you need that audit trail. Awesome. <laughs> so, um, you know, one of the things that I hear a lot when I go talk to, to game developers is that my game today, it runs on an iPhone. Um, you know, by itself, or it runs on Flash in the browser. My next game is going to be a social game that communicates, you know, more than one player via the cloud, you know, iPhone to iPhone or, or whatever. Um, and, and so that's sort of, when you start hearing that, that means that you know you're in the middle of a paradigm shift. Like the normal thing is for the next thing to be different. Um, what I wonder is, you know, the beginning of a paradigm shift is often sort of accompanied with the old paradigm breaking down. Um, so I'm curious, you know, how, when did you first start to realize that the traditional, you know, back-end data stack wasn't going to cut it for this kind of work? Yeah, I want to start because our experience is a perfect I mean, demonstration of that because we were working on a MMO game and previously we were, the, the, the architecture was using a shared memory and that back-end we store everything into the database in a regular basis. And when we, when we shift from the traditional MMO game to the, to the casual game, it, 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 it basically there is a bottleneck because we cannot put user into uh, uh, each, I mean, different servers. I mean, traditionally in MMO, for example, in World of Warcraft, you put user into different realms, and though all the user activities are limited in certain realms, so they can use a single database to store all the user data for that realm, and they can use the server memory to host all the user data. But when you move on to the social game, so <coughs> it, it, all your, because you, you, you can't just store each user in a particular server because user has connections with all pe different people because their, their neighbors could be like, a, I mean, for example, I'm in United States, my friends in China, I mean, they can, they can just uh, across the countries. So everything has to be stored in one place, right? So, so storing everything in one place, that means 
like millions, even billions of data, right? You won't be able to just persist everything into one single database node. So at that moment, I mean, we realized the traditional database system is so difficult to scale. It's, it's basically won't satisfy those kind of requirements. So we have to use some different strategy, and then we found NoSQL. And NoSQL basically, they, they, are, they natives, late, natively support sharding strategy, which basically just the, the, at the back end, they, they, they store your data into a particular server based on their hashing algorithm. Right? You, don't need not to, you do not need to ca care about that. When you add new nodes to that, they re rehash the, 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 the system. They rehash the, the keys and they put that to, it's still, the, so it's always just evenly distributed to all different nodes. So that's basic exact the technology we're looking for. So that's, that's why we change from the traditional database system to the NoSQL database system and, and I think that's definitely a good move for us. And when I started in social gaming, um, you know, it was kind of commonplace to build your application on a traditional LAMP stack using a relational database. But the landscape at the time was quickly changing where games were, uh, were evolving, the data sets were getting uh, a little bit larger, the uh, transactions were a lot higher. And we found that even though we were using a relational database, we were accessing it using a, a key all the time. Um, you know, it, early on, you know, we might have had multiple keys that we were selecting against, but as the system started to scale out, it became a little bit less efficient to have multiple indexes in a relational database. And, you know, that's kind of when we came to uh, uh, realize the value of a NoSQL solution for this type of application. And I can actually speak to ours. Ours was in the design phase. So we sat down and said that, um, the, the methodology we wanted to use was thin client that we could easily replace clients so that we could quickly bring our products into different markets and different platforms. Um, we, we believe in the iOS platform, but who knows what's next, right? There could be some great device that comes out. So um, when, I, when I say thin client, I'm not kind of throwing that term around. I mean, it's really like very, very thin, paper thin. <laughs> um, so uh, when we started talking about the design of the architecture, this is a few years back, uh, Andrew and I were, t were kicking around. It's like, okay, well, he said, how many people do you want to be able to have, you know, access? It's like, well, I, you start doing the math. You say, well, we have this many customers around the world, and it's tr truly millions and millions. And then you say, um, across these devices, we already know we have four devices, right? And um, the minute you start doing that kind of math, and you say we have 100 games, and we want them all to be on one service with all the data in one place so that we can dig and mine and do all that, you start coming to the conclusion that, you know, you need to be able to handle what, what other companies would think of as like 100 million um, DAU. That's basically the kind of traffic you're talking about. And it's like, well, you can't do that. You'd have to break them up into user groups and, or by platform or by device or all that. And so it's like, yeah, but we give up so much in the design. If we have to start sharding out or, or, or isolating all this data, then you're going to just be doing these massive uh, merge, merge uh, operations with your SQL database to try to figure out what the hell's going on in a game. So at the end of the day, we just, uh, no SQL became the solution. It was like, oh, there, there you go, there it is. And uh, I was actually at Zenga at the time that we were talking about it. So um, there were lots of, lots of different solutions we looked at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, before you finish this, I want to add one thing that before we actually using Couchbase, we have another solution available that we basically use memcache as the front end and the memory cache. And at the back end, we use MySQL to persist the data, then we rea realize this is like doable. I mean, but it's not perfect solution. We have to implement, first we have to implement a system to persist the data from memcache to the database. This is already a lot of overhead to do. And another, another thing is um, you still cannot guarantee all the data will be persisted I mean, in time, right? Because if there is any server, um, I mean, I mean, I mean, for example, outage that causing the, your memory cache server to go down. Some of your user data would be still missing. So then we found the Couchbase, and that, that basically merged that mem cache solution and the database solution together. And this saved a lot of time. I mean, this, this is definitely awesome for us. I think the previous talk was talking about what happens when memcache runs out of memory too. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> Things That's get ugly true. fast. So. And another thing, the memcache that does not provide replications. They, they yeah. only, there is one workaround, they, they, they call, some, somewhere modify the memcache system to allow certain I mean, replication, but that's really preliminary stage that we don't really trust them. So yeah, that's the primary issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we actually started implementing these solutions when we 
started out on a relational model, putting a caching layer between the application and the database, and then later taking the database and sharding it across multiple machines. But that became an operational <coughs> headache. When something broke, it was really hard to fix. There were lots of moving parts, a lot of complexity in the, app, in the database back end. And, um, you know, in, on top of it, it was really expensive. Again, we were just doing mostly key value lookups and having a relational system on top of that requires a completely different architecture than, you know, something like Couchbase that runs on commodity hardware. So um, I, I'm hearing kind of similar stories from everybody about running with a, a front-end data storage, the simple API, you know, a key value or, or maybe, you know, whatever kind of query capability you still can get out of Memcached, you know, or out of MySQL after you've sharded it completely. Um, so the, I guess the, the question is, on the other hand, I'm hearing a lot about you got to go deep to get metrics to really understand your games and understand where success is coming from. Um, so you're able to power the gameplay without rich queries, but you've got to have some business intelligence stack. Um, so I guess there's a two-part question, sort of what does that look like now? Um, you know, maybe even what did that look like before you were using Couchbase and now, and then, and then with 2.0 and the incremental MapReduce, um, you know, I, I'm not going to suggest that would take up the whole business intelligence workload, but I wonder, does that, is that exciting to you or are you kind of looking at the possibilities with that? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, you know, some of the exciting things that have come out from um, the recent developments in Couchbase are the uh, Hadoop connector um, and the Elasticsearch plugin. So, you know, traditionally in uh, this space using key value stores, we had to accomplish some of these same <coughs> challenges, but in-house. Um, you know, so there, there have been some developments now with the Couchbase product that allow you guys to implement that relatively hassle-free. And so do you want to maybe tell us just briefly what some of the in-house stuff looks like? Um, mostly hacked together scripts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's always the best answer. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we, we're actually not really using Couchbase for the, uh, the matrix stuff. So because Tencent has their own um, matrix system that we're, we're currently using MySQL, but we already see some of the bottleneck because, I mean, it's using a single node MS, M MySQL. They have to delete the old data in a, <coughs> like a, uh, uh, like a periodic, periodically. So uh, Couchbase 2.0, like what you mentioned, the, the in incremental map reduce is definitely a very good option. I'm lo really looking forward to seeing that. And if, I mean, we, we have the chance to develop our own um, matrix system, I mean, it, it will be a definitely a wise choice to just use Couchbase because we can scale the, the system, I mean, I mean easily. I mean. And we, we actually use multiple systems. We have um, a live system that uses mostly accumulators for live data so that we can monitor. Um, we, we have multivariant test suite that we've built. So as we go to rely, release um, updates to one of the products in the social space um, and probably in the in the gaming space too, if we can if you can isolate it so that the regulators don't feel it has to be resubmitted, we can actually do uh, cohort testing, and so um, multivariant uh, cohort testing. In that process, um, uh, you, you need to have really, really very, very fast access to data, and it has to be on a dashboard while you're doing it, because if you release to some number of customers and something goes horribly wrong, you need to be able to roll back right away. So we have a system that does that that's in-house and, and been built on top of... Um, it's actually outside of the whole uh, the framework for the data capture. The, then the data itself is, because it's an API-based framework, it also echoes the data to a Hadoop cluster. So we can do rich um, research and, and heavy duty uh, queries there. And then also, we echo it to a place called Cotangent, or Conta Contagent, Contagent, Contagent right. that does um, some really great uh, app metrics. And uh, I, I saw those guys, um, one of my f former colleagues uh, as one of the founders there, and after uh, being at Zynga and seeing what the tools were that Zynga built on their own, because there was no such there was no such animal when they built them, uh, the stuff at Contagion was just so much richer. So uh, love the dashboards. Um, doesn't solve all the problems, but the problems it solves it solves very nicely. Mm -hmm. it, it strikes me as interesting. Um, there's <coughs> there's sort of the analytics that's the the OLAP kind of back end processing, figure out you know where to put more investment. Um, and, and then there's the stuff you're talking about now with, you know, A-B testing with users or, 
Um, I, I mean, I'm wondering, like today, uh, for instance, if you're mostly using a key value store for a game, um, are you able to, in real time, kind of make the game adjust itself to user preferences, and uh, you know, or, or or does that have to go through? You, a, you wouldn't a hit loop? Your, you wouldn't hit your database like that. No. That would yeah. be a very bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that'll be that's the change I'm looking for. I'll, I'll be watching for <laughs> okay. more of that in the future. I mean, it's important to have um, the gaming industry, the gambling industry, calls them instant promotions. Um, it's really important that you gather some amount of information to be able to, to give somebody live feedback. Um, but uh, that system, actually, there isn't really, um, I mean, even Couchbase is not, a, there is no database solution for that that's going to work well. It, it, not necessarily because you couldn't do it. Um, the expense of doing it would, be, would start to become a problem, too, because if you're constantly querying, you're mm -hmm. creating more traffic. And that's one of the reasons we built a RESTful API and uh, zero state games. So, so you need uh, like some kind of back-end event architecture to have a lightweight way to get... Yeah, you need something else that does um, aggregation and analytics without having to go back and forth to your database all the time because you're really not... That's not a piece of data that you have to store. It's echoed, so you don't have to store that that uh, that that piece of information in your database. It can always be created, but it has to be immediately available. So you're really using aggregators. That's our problem anyways. I, mean, I don't know about you guys. <laughs> Historically, we've split out those two problems where uh, the key value store like Couchbase becomes a container for all of the user data and the game data, and then the applications emit events to log files or collectors that then aggregate that data and, and load it into a warehouse, something like Hadoop. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'll, um, I would say if you uh, really want to implement those kind of auto feedback system, and I mean, it's still doable, but most of the cases not on the database side, it's mostly on the game server side, right? You need to implement a very like good logic to, to, to use, take good use of the feedbacks. And it's basically like, uh, I, don't, I don't see any limitation on the database that will, will prevent you from doing that. So it's, it's doable, but I, we haven't started doing that. And I don't see much value of doing that. It's a kind of, sometimes it can easily create some um, complicates that you don't want to experience. Yeah, I guess it's a, one of those things depends on the content. I'm, right now I'm, <coughs> I'm uh, sitting here being really inspired by the McGraw-Hill stuff where they're making a kind of custom <laughs> search yeah. engine. Um, so Love the incrementers you guys have too, though, so that's going to be, that's a really powerful feature. You can use that for a lot of things. Yeah. Um, so the kind of the last question on my list here, and then, and then if people in the audience have questions, we can shift to that is, um, and and uh, Lou, you got to answer this earlier today, but just sort of, um, how did you, you know, how did you hear about Couchbase? I mean, I mean, how you got started? Some of the some of the war stories we already heard, but just kind of where did where did you even get the idea to to look at it? Um, um, let the other gents go. I think yeah, I, yeah. <coughs> um, yeah. I started in uh, social gaming um, around 2008, and um, you know, like I mentioned earlier, at that time. Um, it was appropriate to put a game on a relational database, but it didn't work for very long. Um, we tried caching on the application layer in front of the database, but that didn't really make sense, having these two pieces. One is a cache and one is a data store, and you end up with some inconsistencies between the two. It becomes a big operational headache. Um, you know, no SQL data stores that uh, Store memory, store data in memory, and allow you to persist that back to disk made a lot of sense. Merging the two uh, systems that we were already using, um, we tried a couple of different NoSQL databases, um, and eventually uh, found this product, uh, Membase, at the time um, that we started using, and really kind of fell in love with. Um, one of the things that really compelled me to uh, this product in particular was the attention that was paid to some of the more operational aspects. You know, it's nice to have a key value store that persists data back into a uh, disk, but what happens when a server fails? Uh, having failover that you can, you know, add a server into a cluster and click a button and have it rebalance and having data replicated across is a huge value add once the game is actually in production. It's a, just to build on that real fast, it reminds me way back in Westwood days when we first started with our RAID systems, and we had RAIDed hard drives, and we had the hot spare, and you know, prior to that time, if you lost a, a, a server, you were in an in a absolute panic, and maybe you lost your data, and then you had these great RAID systems where you could have one or even two hot spares, 
device would go out, they'd get a, a report and start rebuilding the image on the on the hot spare. You could even lose all of them and still be running in a redundant. And it's exactly what I tell people all the time. It's not you don't want it just for uh, you don't want it just for performance. It's also it's also stability. It's also you know data integrity. Yeah, for us, like what I just mentioned, that uh, previous we run in the MMO world, and, and basically we don't see much needs of doing that. Then we move on to the, the uh, move on to the social world. And the, the first presentation I uh, paid attention was uh, Zynga's uh, like presentation in GDC 10. There is a presentation talking about the uh, social game server architect. Um, they actually did not mention the uh, no SQL solution at that time. They basically just mentioned the MySQL, but they, they already give you some options about how do you scale the MySQL database, but that requires a lot of work to do. Then we realized something that might be useful, then we, we look up uh, on the market and we found that a lot of no SQL solution does exactly what they were doing. So um, then, I mean, as I just mentioned, we started use by using a combination of uh, memcache and a, a MySQL solution. Then we found actually Couchbase just to provide them together with to us, and uh, we do not need to do anything between the connection of the memcache and the um, database. So I mean that's definitely a clear choice for us. We did a lot of um, experiment and did a lot of stress testing, and I mean. Uh, Tencent is a big company. The op, our ops has a very strong requirement of any new product. Right? So they, they are very resistant to taking a new product into the existing system. They don't want this, the, the product to break the existing system. They don't want the product to be vulnerable to attack. So they basically did a, a like a, almost a half month test against the Couchbase. And um, and the result is very satisfactory. I mean, they, they care about the stability, scalability, and performance. And all, uh, all those uh, three uh, requirements are greatly satisfied. So that's why they allow us to use that. I mean. <coughs> so so th um, that reminds me of well, basically a question that's been on the back of my mind. So be thinking of, we have about five minutes left. So if you have a question you really want to ask, uh, be ready. Um, so. Uh, what do you what do you guys do to test one of these data layers? What does it mean? I mean, you know, how, how do you trash it to make sure you can trust it? There's a ton of automated tests. We have a couple of our engineers that just really that's all they love to do is figure out how to break things, and they write automated scripts to do spawn a bunch of Amazon machines all over the world and hammer it simultaneously and try to get the cache to get corrupted. And so it's a automated test, and then we have to go through a GLI compliance process where uh, the outside tester goes through, outside testing company goes through and tests thoroughly against regulations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at, at Tencent, we have our own IDC, <coughs> have a lot of like idle machines that we can use to do stress testing. I mean, but for, for s smaller company, I would suggest Amazon Cloud, that's really, really good tool to, to do stress testing. And um, I mean, we have our own test kit to do the stress testing, but like uh, for anyone who do not have that uh, tools, I mean, I would say some, some test tool like Apache, um, I mean Apache Bench could be just used for stress testing. And I mean, beside of stress testing, uh, we do the uh, accident simulation. So basically like uh, uh, in a server environment, we, we take down some of the server, right? we, we, we take away some of the hard drive, and we'll see how the system reacts to that. We don't want the user data to be lost at that time, mm -hmm. and we don't want the system to, I mean, generate some downtime, right? So th th these are basic the the threshold and the, the benchmark we are we're looking for. And yeah, we do automated invalidations of the cache, oh, yeah, that's really, yeah, just na nasty stuff. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Um, what I did, kind of similar, before we put uh, Couchbase into production, was we started up a cluster of six physical nodes, loaded it with data and then set up an application that just mimics the uh, application access patterns, um, adding and removing and updating records. Um, we tried to push it well beyond what our normal ap application expectations would be. Um, we, we ran a six node cluster with something like 200,000 transactions per second, and then just kind of found what would happen if we just pulled the network on a machine or pulled out the uh, um, uh, the power cable, um, what happens when we rebalance, um, does the data still make it to the cluster, 
um, can we still do gets, that kind of thing? I want a YouTube video of that. Yeah. <laughs> Load balancing and, um, and then you have also scale testing and uh, right scale is helping with a lot of testing too. So, so, so give a plug for you guys. <laughs> it's, it's good stuff. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so any questions <coughs> from the audience? As, yeah. Go ahead. So, so the question is how to, how to do transactional type interactions where you have multiple users, multiple documents all being affected without having transactional primitives in the database. Yeah. Yeah, I want to highlight the uh, the memcache API, which Cultbase I mean provides. I mean, basically, Cultbase API is 100% compatible with memcache API. So in memcache, you have two ways to prevent data collision. First way is to do a lock. Um, the memcache API provides lock, but lock is typically uh, slower, right? Because you you don't want your data to be locked, and sometimes you just want to read the data, right? You don't want to generate a lock for that. And but sometimes, uh, I mean. There are two kind of philosophy of the data collision. One is the optimistic philosophy, and another is pessimistic. So in optimistic, optimistic philosophy, then people believe that the collision of data collision is, the chance of data collision is very slim. So typically you don't need to worry about collision, but you, you definitely need to worry about extreme conditions, right? So this is another good feature uh, or good API Memcache provides, they call it compare and set. So basically the, the, the method of that is you, every time when you write a data to the database system, they, they generate an ID associated with that data, which is a unique ID. And that ID will be changed every time a new data got written into that database. So the case is like that. So you have two clients trying to uh, read one data and set their change to that data. So when they read one data, let's say that ID at the moment was 100, right? They got 100 at that, uh, together. And then, I mean, client A did some modification and submitted the change to the database. And this submission changed the, the uh, ID associated with that data. Now the ID become 101, right? Now the client B trying to set the data back to the database. And they compare the existing uh, ID with the one B got. So it's com comparing their 100 with 101. And now they found a mismatch. Now the server will just uh, bounce the request saying that, I mean, the data has been changed before you do the transaction. So you need to roll back. But rolling back means that you, you fail all the operation. You try to reload data and re-execute all the exact, uh, exact I, I mean, all, all the procedures. So this is basic how does the compare and set fix the problem. And I think we are actually using that, it's very useful. And basically, we will see, I mean, there are some actually, uh, there are some like data stats before. We, we, we see like about less than 0.1% of those kind of data failing in all the operations. So it's, the chance is very slim, and, and we can do a quick redo of that. So if you're curious how you would use the CAS operator um, to do you know, a two-phase commit or something. We have documentation. If you know, do the Google search, uh, sitecouchbase.com, CAS, two-phase commit, and you should find it. Yeah. Um, so sure. I, I think we're about <coughs> at the end of the time here. D if there's any any other remarks any any of the panelists want to make, and then uh, just to say that's exactly essentially what we do. But we also have a stateless a stateless environment as well, so that it adds for smoother and cleaner scaling. And since we verify the right, I mean, we use CAS and verify the right at that point. Uh, you know, any kind of an any kind of an error just prevents that that second client from actually taking the action. So you, the, the user never knows as as long as it's fast enough. All right, so let's give <coughs> these guys a round of applause. Cheers. Right. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>